Hello and welcome to the Under Centre Podcast. I'm your host, Dara Mar, and for this part of the show, at least for this first part, I'm only joined by Fionn Malloy. Fionn, how are you? I'm great. It looks like Jake's world-famous viral video clip on the NFL Twitter page <laughs> has meant he's too big for his boots now and he won't come and talk to us anymore. I know we will get to that a little later on, yeah. But uh, I think uh, I think he's had a little bit of taste of success, and uh, I think he's going out on his own. I'm yeah, sure he'll come crawling back. By, I'm sure he'll come crawling back by. I say the second part of this show. I think he'd be crawling back. I think I wouldn't mind. He hasn't asked a question that good on our show since he started. So <laughs> I don't know where he was saving all those questions, but he pulled it out. I don't know. I have it on good, good authority that I think he asked me about some questions now. Ah, okay. Beforehand. So they really came for you. You were his ghostwriter on those questions. I, I cannot confirm or deny, <laughs> okay, but I will okay. confirm that I can, <laughs> I cannot deny it. <laughs> <Gotcha>. <laughs> this is our Super Bowl, or sort of say Super Super Bowl show. We are looking ahead, of course, to the big game on Sunday, and we have a plethora of guests coming up here today. So many people to talk to about the game, and we'll talk a little bit about football in general. Can't we? Can't all just talk about just the game? We've got. Uh, got the likes of Chris Brockman from the uh, Rich Eisen show coming up. We've got a uh, former Munster and Ireland rugby player, Tommy O'Donnell coming up. We have, of course, friend of the show, uh, Rich Hammond, who uh, writes for the Athletic and covers the Rams there. He'll be coming up as well. as m- many, many more. Um, but a few, I have to ask you before we start that, of course, the big game is on Sunday. Yep. Um, and the best part, that I think the one that we're all looking forward to, is the Super Bowl ads? Yeah, I don't know. Have you heard what's the what's the big one going to be dropping? I've heard that Scarlett Johansson and Colin Jost are going to be in an Alexa ad, but that's really okay. the only one I've seen teased. So, well, see, I kind of surprised. I kind of stay away from the tease teasing of, of yeah. ads because I kind of want to be surprised. I say there's going to be obviously a load of film trailers new dropped and everything like mm-hmm. that about upcoming probably Marvel films and probably the, the new Batman film and, and stuff like that. We'll see loads of them and Doritos and, and stuff like that always have good ones too. They always seem to well to pull it out of bag, might pardon the pun when it comes to Super Bowl ads. I have a sneaky confession because up until very recently, I've watched all the Super Bowls on a certain international sports conglomerate. So I never actually have seen any of these world famous Super oh, Bowl ads. So that's why you have to watch it on Game year. Pass. Yeah, you this year I have game. it. This year I have it. I don't I had it last year as well. I don't don't remember why I couldn't watch it last year, but this year I have it. So I'll bet definitely they'll keep my interest at least. They'll have one viewer over the course of the ad breaks anyway and they'll make their money back worth on that i'd say i think it's like one million for 30 seconds worth of an ad at the super bowl isn't it i think it's uh yeah. i think it's more well my attention I think has got to be worth at least a million for 30 seconds yeah i think it's three but uh today's show is brought to you by our friends at avonmore protein they were so kind to gift us some merch for a competition this week so i hope you did um, enter it and thank you to everyone that did enter the competition we really appreciate it. and anyone who entered our competition throughout the whole season we really appreciate it too uh, of course we will run more over the off season and of course in to next season as well make sure you are following our social channels uh, instagram and twitter are both the same at under center pod youtube under center podcast you'll search for you find us there do the exact same thing on the audio side of your podcast you'll find us there too you'll be kept up to date with all of our competitions um, and latest news of course through those sites but uh, i think it's time we get uh, our first guest on the show what do you think absolutely let's get this thing rolling and we are delighted to welcome back friend of the show and of course current west dublin rhinos offensive coordinator but we won't hold that against him too much steve o'rourke <laughs> how are you steve Grant, you're uh, actually since the last time I was on, I've been appointed head coach of the Rhinos. So, uh, doing it all, uh, is this breaking Randall. news? Is this breaking news for our show? Can we <laughs> there you go. Yeah. News? <laughs> you have you have to do like a little sting across it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Taking on the Josh McDaniels role of a play call and head coach. So, well, congratulations on that. Uh, I'm sure. Uh, I'm sure it will be uh, a great season then ahead. We'll get more into that maybe a little later in the chat. But um, I have to ask you, and we're going to be asking every guest now tonight about this, but what is your Super Bowl 
routine? Are you a guy that likes to stay home and watch it at home by yourself? Do you like having friends around? Do you like going out for it? Um, what 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 would be uh what would be your thing to do on Super Bowl Sunday? Yeah, there's no way answering this without sounding like a complete nerd. So uh, I like to watch it at home because I like to watch it on two TVs with one on a slight delay, so that if something cool happens, I can go back and and look at it myself instead of relying on a replay. So I'll tend to have it. I'll tend to have a setup where I have two screens going in front of me and the laptop beside me for, you know, tweet deck or whatever to see what's going on socials. Um, but actually, I much prefer watching it at home, kind of on my own a lot of the time. Like, and that's I've gone out a few times and it's it's fine. But like, you're in my case, you start drinking at like six seven o'clock in the evening, and by the time the game actually kicks off, you're not really paying that much attention to it. Um, <laughs> but like, it's given the last two years. I mean, I wouldn't begrudge anyone going out and and, and enjoying uh, the Super Bowl this year. What is a party food staple at a Super Bowl that you have to have there? Well, the one thing I don't want is wings, right? Because wings, <gasps> yeah, no, wings are the stupidest food alive, right? Because are imaginable because the so this is the end award race. Thank you very much for taking Sorry, because... all the hot takes here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, like the effort to reward with wings and like the mess that they leave, it's just not worth it. Like there's not enough substance there. So uh, one thing I'm a big fan of is like some sort of like uh, nachos and a dip because that's fine. You can just go at them and graze all night. Like that's fine. But I think the biggest one for me is that halftime pizza. Go away, make put the pizza on just before halftime. Let watch the halftime show, and by the time you come back for the third quarter, it's just perfect, and you can you can enjoy that for the third quarter. Give you like, a carb boost to keep you going for the rest of the game. No, I've not heard of that before. That is actually an excellent strategy. You can tell you are the head coach there with your two <laughs> two laptops, and then you have the the strategic pizza there. It's cooking over halftime too. I like I like the mindset there. I'll let the wing sing pass for now, just for <laughs> that. Then, <laughs> but we must ask that you you mentioned it briefly there at the start. Of course, you are um, a Raiders fan. Um, they have recently hired former Patriots offensive coordinator Josh McDaniels as their new head coach and former director of personnel uh, Dave Ziegler as their new GM. Uh, what are your thoughts on the hires? I think the Ziegler hire is the most important part of it uh, because McDaniels as a play caller and as a coach, there aren't many questions over um, the issue in, in Denver when he took on that head coaching role, aside from you know filming other teams was his personnel uh, decisions, like drafting Tim Debo. Like, that's unforgivable, and it's a wonder he's actually getting a second chance. But he genuinely seems like he's learned from that experience. And he was really, like, he was incredibly humble, I thought, in the press conference. Because a lot of those Belichick guys, when when they leave, they try and become Bill Belichick. And the thing, with, and most of them, because McDaniels has been there as OC for so long, are defensive guys, and they try to... They try to instill that Patriot way and stuff like that. And, you know, anyone with even a passing interest in the NFL will know that the Raiders, you know, tradition and the Patriot way are complete. They're polar opposites. So it'll be interesting to see how he goes about it. But I I feel bad for uh, Rich Bisaccia. I thought he had a really good shot at the head coaching gig. I just think that the the ceiling with Bisaccia is just that much lower than McDaniels. And I think if anyone's going to get... I, you know, I said it I, on this show before that I think Derek Carr is, you know, a top eight, potentially top five QB with the right play caller. And I think McDaniels is the perfect play caller. We saw what he did with Mac Jones. We saw what he did with Tom Brady for years. And, and, and in play style and in pre-snap reads, Carr is right up there with any QB in the league. So that's going to be the most interesting. Thing. That is, of course, if they extend them, because they might, in a in a, if, if Russell Wilson stays put, if Aaron Rodgers stays put, like, Derek Carr is the best quarterback in free agency and it's potentially going to be like, because he's not going to play under a, a non-guaranteed contract next year. So it's either a new deal or he, he leaves. And I think there's, there's benefits to both, like for, both for the player and for the team. Mm -hmm. Steve, it's been a difficult year for the Raiders. A lot of stuff going on throughout the team, obviously the head coach and the players as well. And as you mentioned, the interim coach did a very good job uh, getting things back on track. In your opinion, this year, was it just an unlucky set of circumstances where some of these personalities happened to be around the team? 
or obviously I'm a Washington fan. So do you think it's in a certain extent, a little bit of a culture change needs to happen there? Or do you think now that the year is over and the new men have been put in place, that pretty much addresses that problem and you guys can move forward and just forget about last season? Yeah, like so many of the Gruden Mayock picks have busted out already that it feels like it's not a huge job to do a clean sweep. I think the the Gruden thing is a perfect example of nostalgia getting in the way of, of common sense. Like the 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 idea that you could step away from the game as long as he had and then come back and adapt to like what is a completely different NFL than 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 he had like than he had left the first time. And it only it actually shows in the play calling and what they had to do to be successful. Like to be successful this year, after how many years? Four years of the group thing, they had to run a completely different offense than every other team. You know, all those heavy personnel, lots of tight ends on the field. And like it was almost papering over a lot of cracks within the wider organization. So it feels like because it's such a weird situation for McDaniels to come into. Like you rarely go into a 10 win team and are asked to make them better, but I honestly think that with the right coaching and the Henry Rogue stuff was like horrible, both for the family of that poor woman, the woman herself, and for Rogues, whose career and life are, are ruined because of a stupid decision. But like players take those decisions and players wave around guns and Instagram videos threatening lives because the culture of lack of accountability isn't there. Um, and so I think that's the first thing McDaniels needs to do. And he doesn't need to go the full Bill Belichick, like Patriot way, uh, route but what you can do is say right it's one and done in terms of chances like if you cross me if you cross the team that's it you're done um, so I, I'm looking forward to seeing that and I think what we saw as well and I think this was an issue raised with the move to Vegas is maybe Vegas isn't the best place for a professional sports team like it, the, the, the things that you can do in Vegas compared to other cities like there's a big difference big big difference between playing for the Raiders in Vegas and playing for Denver Broncos like you know like there's in, in terms of the temptations I suppose for players and coaches so I'm I'm optimistic that McDaniels and Ziegler can bring about a change and I think having a winning season to base that off encourages and attracts you know a better caliber of player in free agency as well so I hope so I think is the the short way of answering your question I, I like but you as a Washington fan, me as a Raiders fan, like culture is so hard to change. Like mm -hmm. it's so hard to change. It's ingrained in the fabric of the team. And let's see. Yeah. Speaking of culture, that's, that's so hard to change. Um, the big news last week, of course, was the, uh, the Brian Flores lawsuit um, and sort of the incredible, you could say text exchange between him and Bill Belichick getting the wrong Brian um, <laughs> who's texting. I am, um, what what do you make of, of the lawsuit in general? It, it may, I I, I I just in the notes I was saying like even if if Flores is is unsuccessful, do you think like this lawsuit especially could force the NFL to change? It? And I ask because it's interesting because Fiona and myself we were at the uh, the Jeff Reinbold sort of Q and A session that he had last week, and that question was brought up about the um, lack of um, minority and, and black head coach hires. And he says, he mentioned himself that the NFL, um, I have it here, are doing everything they can to get a more to get more black and minority coaches just short of mandating it. Um, and he says, of course, it's still up to the owners at the end of the day who they choose to be their head coaches. And I just uh, like to say, what, what was your view on, on all the news that came out last week about it? Well, I think to answer the First part, I think it's already had an impact because I don't think we see Lovey Smith as the head coach of the Houston Texans if what happened over the last week doesn't happen. I think they go with McCown. And I think this has this lawsuit has put a lot of pressure on teams to kind of sit back and think about okay, well, why are we why are we hosting interviews with people we have no intention of hiring? Like and and the, the thing is the, the the black head coaches and the minority head coaches they know in a lot of situations that they're only there to tick a box to tick the Rooney rule, like in theory the Rooney rule is an exceptionally good idea and like because you know in a league where seventy percent of players are, are are black to have so few head coaches of color is just it doesn't make any sense other than discriminatory hiring practices, so I think 
it's already having an impact. And I think I have a feeling it may go the Colin Kaepernick route that someone's just going to have to take the hit for the benefit of everyone else. And Flores almost admitted as much himself that if other head coaches don't get on this lawsuit, don't join the class action, then he kind of has torpedoes in his own, his own career. Like you have to remember he released this lawsuit when he was still in the running for two other jobs. So like he knows the impact that, that it's going to have. And I just like, Jeff Reinbold is right that the NFL is doing everything they can, like other than other saying, okay, X number of teams have to have a black head coach, which is ridiculous because how are you going to even judge which teams are, are, are going, that's going to be. But what I would say needs to change is ownership. Like we have one minority owner of color in the entire national football league. And that speaks to wider issues in American society, obviously, and in terms of with distribution of wealth and not to sound all Karl Marx on it. Like that's what needs to change. There needs to be player like, but the thing is there used to be a case that players could get rich enough that they could afford to buy NFL teams. NFL teams are now worth so much money. It's your Mark Zuckerberg's, it's your Elon Musk's, Jeff Bezos. They're the people who can afford to buy NFL teams. Ex-players can't put together a conglomerate to buy NFL teams. And I think that is, that's an issue that the NFL is not going to be able to solve. So what the answer is, I don't know, other than, like, how often do do the likes of Byron Leftwich and uh, and Eric Bieniemy have to prove themselves and not even get a shot at, like, the head coaching position when... You know, Joe Judge was a head coach in the National Football League. <laughs> like, it's it just to me like black coaches just have to work so much harder and get such less opportunity when they do get become a head coach. Like, look at Flores; he's a winning record. He got the team to the playoffs when they shouldn't. Have, they had no business being near the playoffs, and he's gone. Like, he's gone for like very tenuous reasons. And then, of course. They hire the hot new offensive coordinator and they announce it as like a mixed race hire. And that's fair enough. But like that's you don't get brownie points for hiring the best person for the job or for hiring the right person either. Like you have to give everyone a fair opportunity and like like take any job, like any job. If you identify someone that you want to come into a role. It's very hard to look at anyone else, no matter how well they interview, no matter how smart they are. But be honest about that. Like, don't don't give Brian Flores an interview knowing that Bill Belichick already knows the Brian the job has gone to Brian DeBall. Like, that's where it's that's where it's unfair. You just ring the person up and you say, "Look, I'm really sorry, but actually, we were really impressed in this interview today, and we're not going to we're not going to waste five hours of your life running an interview." and I just think the transparency needs to be better, but like it's it's the NFL transparency is never going to be there. Yeah, I, I it's interesting that you mentioned about that because and you, you briefly mentioned Eric the enemy because I was going to ask a follow up with that because he has had I think it's fourteen head coaching interviews and he still hasn't been hired, and the most recent one was with, was with the Saints where I think. Almost any NFL follower and their dog knew that they were going to go with Dennis Allen as the head coach. And this looked like a clear example of ticking the box for the Rooney rule that they were only interviewing the enemy because he was a a, 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 um, a black or minority sort of prospective head coach candidate. Um but I just wonder if if the these coaches are sort of you know getting these feelings where look listen i'm just here so you i'm just here because you need to follow the rules do they start maybe having to and i don't know if it's going to look bad for them start rejecting these sort of interviews and start calling these teams out saying i feel like i'm not getting a fair shake at this yeah i think that's the i think it's the only way like i mean uh herd bryant the the american author he has a really good point on all of these like kind of big issues on and he, he talks about kaepernick as being it's not necessarily a race thing it's it's an employment dispute and workers need to rise up all the time because employers will always take advantage of what they perceive to be a weak workforce and at the moment lfn nfl owners know that the likes of eric bien the likes of byron leftwich will take an interview because they're so desperate to get that big head coaching job. And like left, which is the perfect example, actually the enemy, sorry, is the perfect example of 
the double standards of of the NFL because you know the the the, the slight on him is always but he's not the play caller. He might have designed the playbook. He might coach up that offense, but he's not the play caller. Andy Reid is. Well, who's the new head coach of the Miami Dolphins? Mike McDaniel didn't call plays in San Francisco. You know, Kyle Shanahan called those plays. And yet, his first interview, he gets a head coaching job. Like, what's the difference between those two guys? That's that's the sad that's the saddest part of it all. And I just I hope it I hope it can be different soon. And I, I think you're right. Like I think a labor dispute, but players have power here. Players who support their coaches can go, okay, do you know what? Well, look, we're down in tools. We're not playing. We're not going to do OTAs. We're not going to do the mini camps until you actually sort out the coaching structure and give actual coaches a head. Like there was one stage not when there was a couple of jobs vacant. There was as many coach head coaches in the NFL who were sons of previous head coaches as there was coaches of color. Like that is a weird situation to have in, in any sport. And I know there are only 32 jobs. I So it's in a very exclusive club. But there's no one could sit here and say that black coaches and coaches of color um, are getting a fair shot. There's absolutely no one. And that's why if if everyone can see it's an issue, then something has to be done about it. I think the Saints, the Saints and Biennemi and Dennis Allen kind of sums up the limitation of the Rooney rule, right? I don't have a problem with the Saints. He's an inside guy. It's very obvious he's been around for a while. I have no problem with the Saints tapping him to say, I like him in our system. He knows our guys. We want to keep going with the Saints system. The problem is they're then forced to bring the enemy in to have one of these throwaway interviews because they still have to tick the Rooney rule. So yeah. I think that goes back to, like you were saying earlier, Steve, is they, there needs to be more proactive. And again, this. There's limits with mandate. There's limits with all sorts of other stuff. It has to be that somebody somewhere at the top has to go, let's just give the best people the jobs, the best fit for the jobs. And in an ideal world, it doesn't matter the race. And by the pure statistics, there should be majority black head coaches because yeah. everyone's looking for this experience of that coaching playing side. It helps you get into the game. It helps you understand the game. There's numerous benefits to being a coach having been a former player uh, and we just have to hope that i don't have the answers steve i'm sure you don't have the answers we can we can run around i have to as you said dara you have to give the nfl a certain amount of credit they are trying to be as proactive as they can but really rich people like you said own these teams the business now has so much money in it that puts pressures on the players like you said it's not so easy to strike when it's not about your money because you're getting so much money you nearly try and pass it off and say, hey, well, maybe the coaches should go on strike if they really want to sort this problem because the players have their money. They have their collective bargaining agreement. They work really hard to earn that. And they don't want to jeopardize that good faith that they have. So, look, it's a really complicated topic. It always is. American politics and life always seems to add an extra, extra wrinkle into it. But, yeah, yeah it's a super complicated issue at the moment. Exactly. Um, let's look ahead then to to the game this Sunday um, and I want to know is there any particular matchup you're looking forward to seeing most oh well I'm sure I won't be the, first, the only person to answer this but it's that Rams defensive line and what they're going to do with the uh, the Bengals offensive line uh, it just feels like this is the nightmare matchup for the Cincinnati Bengals like you have all that talent like Aaron Donald on his own is going to be hard for that offensive line to stop so to you know to, to, to face the might of that um that Rams defense is going to be really really tough I think for for Cincinnati but I was looking at some film during the week of Joe Burrow and honestly his pocket presence I know he took nine sacks against the Titans but actually his pocket presence in that game stopped that from being 20 sacks um, he is incredibly good at just at the last second sensing where the pressure is coming from but that's when there is a gap to walk through or get through to step up into the pocket if there's no gaps, if there's nowhere for him to, to, to go that's where he's going to struggle um, and on the other side of the field, I, I think the other the only, the only other matchup that's really intriguing for me is, is um, what the Bengals do with Von Bell um at safety against against Matthew Stafford and that offense because what they've been doing really well since about week five is disguising where they're putting him whether he's playing deep whether he's you know blitzing and 
his job essentially has been to cover like those backside reads on plays. So he's not necessarily on the, the primary receivers. He's always on like the second or third check down. And that's where the Rams have been making so much hay as an offense this year. They, they line up in that three by one set and, you know, you've Cooper cup sometimes just running a roof for the sake of clearing out the field. And then the other two are actually the reads for Stafford. And then you've got then Od- Odell Beckham Jr. Then the other side running something across the middle of the field, and it's a first down, and it's a, it's a really really useful play for them. They've been using it quite well. But what Bell has done in his kind of in the way that the the, the Bengals defense has run is is kind of cover that that backside option. So that safety net for for Stafford isn't going to be there. So I think there's a lot of kind of fascinating matchups, but. On both sides of the ball, they're the two that I'm kind of most interested in seeing. Excellent. Yeah, I know. And look, the, the Bengals don't have a bad uh, defensive line themselves. And um, especially uh, the, the Rams are weak in the right tackle position with Havenstein. I think he's allowed in seven sacks this season. Um, I think then and then the most, of course, uh, for anyone in one year is eleven. So he's he's definitely up there, and with Hendrickson and Hubbard and uh, Hill as well, they they are going to cause uh, Stafford a couple of issues. Yeah, it depends on what they're like. Stafford has been eating pressure alive, especially blitzes this year. Like so, like they're going to have to be really. It's one of those really tough situations where, like, if you blitz him, he can cut you. If you don't blitz him, he can cut you. Like it's it's a tough ask, but I think what. What's good about the Bengals' defense and the defensive line particularly is they don't ask them to do anything special. It's all bull rushes. Like there's none of this trying to bend the pocket or anything. Like it is straight through the offensive lineman's chest. It is. It is pure raw talent. It's the the idea of saying like Henderson especially, I'm bigger than you. I'm stronger than you. I'm getting through you. Um. So I think that's going to be interesting. I think the 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 way Stafford has has dealt with that so far has been the, his ability. His arm strength is just so on a different level than Goff was in that offense that he can throw the ball pretty much from any angle. And I think that's what makes like people slag him for those sidearm throws. Those sidearm throws are what stopped the ball from being batted down at the line of scrimmage because he's getting them around the defensive lineman rather than trying to go through their hands. So I think, uh, I think there's a lot of, there's a lot of questions that I think too many people already think the um, the Rams offense has an answer for because Sean McVay is such a smart head coach that I I'm not so sold that the Bengals defense is going to be the the you know the the worst of all four sides of the ball if you know what I mean in this one I think they've they've definitely got a role to play and we saw we saw what they did against Patrick Mahomes the best quarterback in football like they made him sometimes. Uh, so I, like we we spend so long like looking at the X's and O's, looking at coaches' film, looking at schemes. Sometimes guys just play really well, and that's what they did against the the Chiefs. Like they man for man, they played exceptionally good defensive football. It was simple. If you go back and look at the all twenty two, there's nothing complicated about what they're doing. They might disguise it by like dropping safeties late or you know showing cover two, but actually running man or whatever. Like. But they're running really basic high school football concepts. Even there's there's one they do with Hendrickson where just before the snap, he steps out from his gap and tries and and changes his attack angle. And if you did that at the college level, they just hand the ball off to the running back and the running back could go for 15 yards because there's nobody in the, well Hendrickson is such a freak of an athlete, he can cover two gaps. He's such a big man. So it, it to me it's it, it's it's football at its simplest, but that doesn't mean it's not enjoyable to watch. Like it's really actually it's quite fun to watch. Yeah. And I, I know you're short on time, so I'll ask you very quickly, um, who's winning the game Sunday? <sighs> so I felt that with a better play design on fourth down, the Raiders would have taken the Bengals to overtime and beaten them in that game. I felt with anyone that's not Ryan Tannehill at quarterback, the Titans would have beaten the Bengals in that game. And I felt that with an 18-point lead at home, the Chiefs should have beaten the Bengals in that game. So the Bengals are playing here with house money. Um, I think the Cincinnati Bengals are going to win because Joe Burrow is the best player in the game, uh, best offensive player in the game. I think Sean McVay will get too conservative. I think the Rams will build the lead to probably 10, 12 points. Sean McVay will do what he, for someone who's such a brilliant offensive mind, 
he will get conservative. He will turtle up. The Bengals will come back and they'll win it. Uh, I think they'll have the ball on the final drive and they'll win it with either field goal or a touchdown on that final drive. So the Bengals for me. Excellent stuff. Excellent stuff. Steve, um, as always, it is a pleasure to speak to you. We hope you enjoy the game um, on Sunday with your well-timed pizza and the chips. Um, <laughs> no wings, of course, and we won't no get wings. any wings there. That. Um, we hope to speak to you over the off-season um, at some point as well. Looking forward to it. Thanks for having me on, Lance. No problem at all. Listen, best of luck as well to the Rhinos this upcoming year too. We should and mention that. And to the Pirates as well. Oh, we don't need luck. <laughs> we need a miracle. <laughs> <laughs> we are going to take a quick break, but when we come back, we are going to be speaking to Chris Brockman. <laughs> 